from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring William Holden and Colleen Gray in Appointment with Danger. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The famous Canadian Mounted Police have a reputation for always getting their man. We have the same tenacious, persistent federal agents in our own country. And one of them is the Postal Inspector. In tonight's drama, Paramount Pictures has presented our agent with an assignment that turns into an exciting appointment with danger. And as our stars, we have that popular actor, William Holden, and playing opposite him, lovely Colleen Gray. Now, Appointment with Danger, starring William Holden as Alan Goddard and Colleen Gray as Sister Augustine. The United States Post Office is the biggest business in the world. Every year it handles 45 billion pieces of mail and enough money to pay off the personal debts of everyone in the country. Policing that activity is the job of 800 postal inspectors. This is an account of one of those jobs, and it begins in La Porte, Indiana, where a few hours ago the body of Inspector Harry Gruber was found in an alley. And now, in the city post office... All right, Al, what you say makes sense, I suppose. Gruber was either drunk when they strangled him or asleep. But he never drank, so he must have been asleep. Here in Laporte? Well? I don't believe it, Maury. He was killed somewhere else and brought here. That could be any place. Gruber was on a floating assignment all over Indiana. Yeah. Well, it's a rat race now. Until we find that nun. Nun? Oh, you, uh, you mean one of those sisters? That's right. She was passing that alley last night. She saw two men walking with Gruber, supporting him. When she asked if anything was wrong, one of the men said something about their friend being drunk, so she just kept going. Well, don't try to blame her. I'm not. Fortunately, she passed a policeman not long after and told him, but the cop was on a call. By the time he got back to the alley, all he found was Gruber's body. Mm -hmm. What about that nun? Where is she? We don't know. The police have checked every nun here in Laporte. Not one of them was anywhere near that alley last night. Well, did they bother to check the railroads? Railroads, planes, and buses. Nothing. Well, she's got to be around someplace. How many nuns are there, anyway? I don't know, Al. I never counted them. You're a big help. I'll be even less help. I've got to get back to Washington tonight. From here on in, this is your case. Stay with it, Al. Don't worry. I'll find that nun. I hope so. But you've been chasing hoodlums for so long, you don't know how to treat ordinary people. Warm up, will you? Oh, sure. I'll fall in love for you. I don't think you could, because you don't know what a love affair is. It's what goes on between a man and a forty-five pistol that doesn't jam. Al, let me tell you about you. That badge and a few law books have turned you into a nut. You don't like anybody, you don't believe anybody, you don't trust anybody. You think everybody has a pit. Everybody has. You, I, everybody. We're all working for ourselves. A better job, a little more dough, a round of applause. One way or another, everybody you meet is a pitch artist. Oh, skip it. Just keep me posted. And remember, the biggest thing on your side isn't a pair of brass knuckles. It's time and work and patience. Thanks, thanks. Now, do you mind if I start trying to find out who killed Harry Gruber? No. No, and I'm sure you will, Al. Because you're a good cop. That's about all you are. A turn from Goddard. Have lead on none. Railroad brakeman reports seeing two nuns aboard express same night Gruber was killed. Train was en route to Fort Wayne, and so am I. Mr. Goddard, the Mother Superior said you wanted to see me. I'm Sister Augustine. I've been looking for you for three days, Sister. I'm a post office inspector. Oh, how nice. I'm here investigating a murder. Oh, Well, I'm sure we wouldn't know anything about that. This is a school, Mr. Goddard, an academy. Yes, I know. I followed you here from Laporte to Fort Wayne and now back here. But this, that's not important. What is, is that last Tuesday night you saw three men in an alley in Laporte. Why, yes. Yes, I did. But you were on a train, weren't you? 
Why, that's remarkable. How did you know? Because I checked the bus lines and the airlines and the railroads. You were on a train that doesn't even stop at La Porte. Well, it certainly did on Tuesday night. There was a tie-up of some kind just outside the freight yard. The train stopped, and the conductor said we'd be delayed at least a half hour, so I got off. Why? To get some medicine at a drugstore. Sister Paula, I was traveling with her, wasn't feeling well. Well, neither was the guy in the alley. He was dead. A government agent named Harry Gruber. Oh, how terrible. Did he have a family? What's the difference, sister? He's just as dead either way. Really, Mr. Goddard? The point is, could you identify either of the men who were in the alley with him? Well, one of them, perhaps. He was rather pleasant. He told me the man was intoxicated. Look, would you mind coming with me and checking the police files? They have quite a collection of pictures. Oh, I couldn't, Mr. Goddard. I, I, I have classes in ten minutes. Sister, it's your job to go down there. Isn't there someone else you can get? Even if there were, you should know better. Letting someone else do your job is a design of the devil. I'll see, Mother Superior. You're right about letting someone else do your job. That was merely a quote. Well, whoever said it, it's very true. It's from the writings of Martin Luther. Oh? From his earlier writings, I imagine. I'll be back in a moment, Mr. Goddard. I've never seen so many pictures in my life. It's so hard to believe these men were once children. Little boys. Nice little boys, too. I'm not so sure how nice they were, even as little boys. They just didn't get the proper training. This one did. It says here that he studied to be a carpenter. Then he murdered somebody with a hammer. Mr. Goddard, I don't think that's the least... Oh! Well? This one. I think that's the man I saw in the alley. Yes, I'm sure it is. George Soderquist, huh? Oh, let me have that card. Sergeant. Find anything? A fellow named Soderquist. Do you know him? No, afraid not. What's his record? Three arrests, armed robbery, one conviction. Last known to be in Gary, Indiana. I'll put a call through to Gary right away. Oh, give him a rundown. And also, uh, tell him I'll bring uh, Sister Augustine as long as an identifying witness. Oh, I'm I... afraid the church authorities would frown on that, Mr. Goddard. If we can't find Soderquist, I'll... Don't worry, I'll have you back here in no time. I'll have Washington contact your bishop. Meanwhile, Mr. Goddard, I'm returning to my classroom. You do that, sister. I'll pick you up as soon as I get an okay. Good evening. I'm Mother Ambrose. My name's Goddard. I have a letter here from the bishop. So I understand. Sit down, Sister Augustine. Thank you, Mother Ambrose. I've come to Gary at the request of the police department. We've been advised, sister. You'll stay here at St. Michael's Parish House. Thank you. Is this Mr. Um, uh, Soderquist a friend of your sister? Oh, no, no. I I picked him out of the mug book. Mug book? Sister Frey, she picked up. Oh. Uh, will you be here long, sister? Until we can prefer charges against Soderquist for murder. Are you sure he's a murderer, Mr. Goddard? Yes, but he'll get a trial and everything the law allows. But not one drop of charity. Excuse me, please. There's a Lieutenant Goodman from the police. He's been here waiting for you to arrive. You, uh, you don't think very much of me, do you, sister? I feel sorry for you, Mr. Goddard. I don't think you have a heart. Well, fortunately, that doesn't seem to matter so much to the people I work for, so why don't you just forget... I'm right here, Mr. Goodman. Thank you. Got it? Yeah. I'm Dave Goodman. Homicide. Oh, come on in. Uh, this is Sister Augustine. How do you do? How do you do? Well, we've got your boy Soderquist staked out in the downtown pool room. Ah, that's fine. We can't move, though, until the sister here identifies him. Would you like to come down and have a look? But I... Very well, Mr. Goodman. Mother Ambrose, we'll be back shortly. Where will you be if the bishop or someone should inquire? I'll be downtown, Mother Ambrose, at the pool hall. <laughs> well, uh, not exactly, sister. Oh? There's a hock shop across the street. I've made arrangements with the proprietor. He has a fine view of the pool room. Pool rooms? Hock shops? Must I go? With any luck, you'll be back here in an hour. Let's go, Goodman. Better take another look across the street, sister. We've got to be certain. But I've told you he's the man. The one wearing the coat. That's Soderquist, all right. Well, whoever he is, he's the man who spoke to me in that alley in Laporte. And now I'll, I'll go back to the parish house, if you don't mind. Just a minute. 
That uh, man with him, what about him? I don't know. He, he may be the one who was with him in Laporte, but I, I'm not sure. The pool room's a known hangout for Hoodlum's got it. He may have a record. Yeah, let's find out. Is the tail still on, Soderquist? Sure. Is that all, then? For now, yeah. I'll take you back to St. Michael's. No, no, please. You're going to be busy. I'll just get a taxi down at the corner. It's no trouble at all. Alone? Well, I don't think you should... Good night, gentlemen. <laughs> Yeah. Earl? Mrs. Vegas. Well? We're in trouble, Earl. Five minutes ago, I'm driving down to meet Soderquist at the pool room. Remember I told you about that nun in Laporte? Well, she's here in Gary, the same nun, and a block away from the pool room. She's here for a reason, Earl. I'll get hold of Soderquist. No, no, keep him undercover. Where'd she go, the nun? I don't know. I was stuck with a traffic light. But I'm going to cut this town open and find her. I'm going to find her, see, before she finds me. You might just as well stay here at headquarters, Goddard. I'll be bringing in Soderquist any minute now. Yeah. Say, uh, you know this town, Goodman. Tell me why a couple of gunsels would knock off Harry Gruber. Well, robbery, say? For dough? <laughs> if you're a government cop, you have to marry money to buy a stick of gum. Why would they go to all that trouble taking his body to Laporte? You know, when a hood kills a man, it's a hood who leaves town. Could be because they wanted to stay here in Gary. Be interesting to have Soderquist tell us. Homicide, Goodman. Where? All right, all right. Shake down the district and send some men over to his apartment. I want him in here. You don't have to tell me. He jumped the tail. Any other time, it's a cinch. This time we draw a nearsighted cop. Well, we got to head him off. How tight can you seal this town? Real tight. Okay, lock it up. Without him, we haven't got a lead. We'll have him in here tonight. If you want me, I'll be at the post office. That is, if it hasn't been stolen. Well, I can tell you this much, Carter. I've been postmaster here for ten years. And all that time, I've never known Harry Gruber to do anything but hit town and make a routine check. But this time, you say he suddenly became interested in uh, three of your truck drivers. Well, yes. uh, Yes, uh, these are their photographs. Gruber sat here and brooded over those files all one afternoon. I don't know for sure, but I guess it had something to do with the transfer of money between the two stations. What two stations? Well, here in Gary, we have two railroad stations. On through shipments, we transfer from one station to the other by mail truck. Big shipments? The one from Cleveland's Alulu. And uh, one of these three drivers always handles the run between the two stations? Yes. And that's the last question Gruber asked me. He left here, and six hours later, he was dead in Laporte. Mm -hmm. I bet he called on this guy first, Paul Farrar. Well, Farrar's one of the three drivers, all right. Says here on his record sheet that uh, he was offered a better job, but he turned it down. Now, why would he turn down a $500 a year raise to keep driving a truck? I think he said he'd like to be out of doors. 500 bucks worth? Uh, he's on duty now. I'll uh, send for him. No, no, no. I just want a quick glimpse. If he's the one I have in mind, that's all I'll need. Uh, he'll be down at the loading platform. This way, got it. You see the registry board over there? Well, that's Farrar carrying the sack. This is quite a break, Taylor. I told you that Soda Quist was talking to someone in the pool room. Well, that's who he was talking to, Farrar. Look, you better phone Washington. Get a Hearn back in town. And meanwhile, I, I want a list of all your money transfers. Well, there's nothing missing, Goddard. So Gruber wasn't killed because he found Farrar stealing money. Look, a cheat kills his wife for one of two reasons. Either she's caught him cheating or she hasn't given him the chance. Same way with money. You mean Gruber found out about a deal or something between Farrar and Soderquist? Between George Soderquist and somebody else. That's the big one, Taylor. Who is the somebody else? Now long. Regis. Stay where you are, Earl. I'll be there in ten minutes. The nun, you found her, huh? Yeah. A place called St. Michael's School. Well? Not yet, Earl. But I got a way to do it. Sometime early tomorrow morning. Continue with this week's production of the Hollywood Radio Theater in just a moment. 
Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Take the famous all-Negro basketball team, the Harlem Globetrotters. As unofficial ambassadors, in one year they played ball before more than a million people on four continents. In Rio de Janeiro, they entertained crowds of from 30,000 to 50,000. During one summer, they toured Europe and Africa, chalking up another 600,000 fans. In 1952, they celebrated their 25th anniversary as a team by circling the globe. Yes, sir, the team organized by Abe Saperstein really gets around. And their exhibitions have been more than just a demonstration of American basketball. They've been a lot more. The team is a living example of American fair play and sportsmanship, in and out of uniform. Abe Saperstein now carries a letter which reads in part, The Harlem Globetrotters have proved themselves ambassadors of goodwill. On any future tours, please call on us for any help we can give. And the letter is signed by the United States State Department. In being ambassadors of fair play, the Harlem Globetrotters prove that by helping others, you help your country. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of Appointment with Danger, starring William Holden as Al Goddard and Colleen Gray as Sister Augustine, with Dan Riss as Ahern. It's the following morning. The man called Regus has entered a third-rate hotel and gone directly into the manager's office. Well, what about the nun? She got lucky. Makes sense, Riggis. They're fixing the roof of the school. Tile. Big hunks of tile. Yeah. So accidentally, a big piece of tile falls down just when she's walking past. And like I said, Earl, she got lucky. Well, I'm glad she did. You get Soderquist? Yeah, he's upstairs. You know, you're making too many mistakes, Riggis. Killing Gruber was a mistake. It happened. Now, forget about the nun. We may never hear from her again. Soderquist will hear plenty from her. There's a police call out for him. You sure she can identify him? And what about you? No. But Soderquist could identify me. Well, we've got to get him out of here. Then we'll think about that nun, huh? In case she did something. I said forget about it. I'm still running things. Remember that. Earl, if they ever get me in the back room of police headquarters, I'll remember it fine. <laughs> Come on, Rickus. Let's go up and see Joe. Hi, Earl. Rickus. <laughs> Sit down, fellas. How about a, a cup of coffee, huh? I got rules in this hotel, George. No hot plates. It's a fire hazard. Huh? Oh, oh. Uh, I fixed the room up pretty good, huh? You got to get out of here, George. You see, you've been identified by that sister. You don't know for sure. You told me you didn't know for sure. We can't afford to take a chance, you know that. So you better go to St. Louis for a while. St. Louis? I don't even know anybody in St. Louis. You're not going there to run for office, you know, George. <laughs> You're going to protect yourself and us. Come on, let's start packing. I'll help you. No. No, I'm not going. I told you I didn't want to go. You know what's coming up. You'll be taken care of. How do I know? Because I say so. Or listen to me. That's the most money I ever heard of. If I'm dealt out now, I don't have a prayer. Start packing, George. I'm not going. I'm staying here until I... Regus, no, no. What did I ever do to you? This is Mr. Ahern. Sister Augustine, Mother Ambrose. Mother Ambrose, sister. You see, uh, Mr. Ahern is just as much interested in that accident this morning as I am. That uh, piece of tile, sister, it fell without any warning at all? One of the workmen must have left it too near the edge of the roof. Well, while we're looking for Soderquist, you might be able to help us with the other man in the alley. I'd like you to go through that rogues gallery again. No, 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 that's a waste of time. Sister... I want you to go back to Fort Wayne. Well, why the switch, Al? I thought we well, were... Well, it's a matter of common sense. Sister, while you're here in Gary, we're responsible for anything that happens to you, like this accident. Oh, there's no need to worry about me, Mr. Goddard. I have a guardian angel. You have a what? A guardian angel. It's a new idea to Mr. Goddard, sister. Look, Maury, I've got nothing against angels. I, I just want her to get back to Fort Wayne before she gets hurt. You told me once not to let anyone else do my job. It's my duty to stay, and I'm staying. All right, stay. Oh, there's the dinner bell. I'm afraid you must excuse us, gentlemen. And don't worry, Mr. Goddard. I'll be all right. What would happen, 
Maury, if we put the screws to Farrar. Oh, you'd blow the whole thing, so don't try anything fancy just because you're worried about that nun. I'm not worried about her. I, I just want to find some quick way to shake up Farrar and to find Soda Forget Quiz and... the quick ways. You just stick to straight police work. Come on, let's get out of here. Oh, by the way, Al. Yeah? The nun. What's her pitch? Farrar, you want to play pool, or would you rather talk? Get going, Mac. Me? I'd sooner talk. Oh, you're real friendly, huh? You don't know me. Paul Farrar, P.O. Serial number 20754. Are you a cop? Postal inspector, Al Goddard. I followed you here. Oh, I see. Now, oh, there's a nice, quiet little table in the corner. Let's sit down, huh? What do you... You got some questions or something? Yeah, a few. How would you like to go to prison for the murder of Harry Gruber? What's the matter with you? You're crazy? I don't even know any Harry Gruber. I believe you. But I can rig it so a jury won't. I can break every alibi you've got, and I can prove that you know George Soderquist. That you were with him the night that Gruber was killed. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it's very simple, Farrar. I'm going to railroad you for Gruber's murder. Why? Why go out and just pick a guy up out of thin air? What's the point? The point is that I'll forget the whole thing if I can get the right price. $25,000. Oh, this is just a nice little shakedown, huh? Well, it's my welfare work. I wouldn't want to see you go to prison. Now, where would I get $25,000? Your friends. And you can tell them that I know why you turned down that $500 raise. That doesn't mean a thing. You can also tell them that I know why you drive that mail truck. Because if you don't, all their plans for that robbery go right out the window. Look, I don't believe any of this. Not about Sodaquist or the robbery or this, this shakedown. I don't even believe you're a cop. Then check around. Meanwhile, I'm at the Park Hotel. Talk to your friends, Farrar. And get that money. If you don't, I'm going to frame you and wreck every chance they ever had to pull that robbery. Hey, now, wait a minute. Wait. Why are you doing this? I told you. For $25,000. And I want that money by midnight or I catch the late train for Washington. <laughs> Yes? It's me, Farrar. Well? Well, there's no such thing as $25,000. Okay, beat it. You mean you'd still frame me? Sure I would. Uh, look, look, I, I know some of the men that Sodakris knows, and I've talked to them. But they haven't got that kind of money, and I'm not in whatever they're doing. Oh, sure, but sure. But I'll go along with you in any way I can. Is that why you're here? Well, they want to meet you. They say they'll try to work out something. I, I think they're scared. Yeah, scared to death. Well? Look, I don't want to talk to any third parties. There'll be no tape recordings and no tricks. I'm going to talk to you and you alone. But as far as I'm concerned, the talk's finished. Now, look, give me a break, will you? I have anything to do with this. I don't believe a word you've said. Except there isn't any that kind of money. Okay. I'll buy my racing stable some other time. Meanwhile, I'll concentrate on being a hero. Will you listen to me? It's not my fault. Forget the deadline. You've mapped it. I'm the one that's going to go to prison. What can I do? That's your problem. You still going to take that train to Washington? Well, sure. Yeah, why not? Get going, Farrar. Get out of here. Yes? This is Goddard. I just thought I'd call you, Maury. I've checked out of the hotel, and I'm counting on somebody to beat my brains out in about 30 minutes. Al, what are you trying to tell me? Well, it's one of those quick plans, the kind you don't approve of. But I got a pretty fair chance of finding out who killed Harry Gruber. They've got plenty of reasons now to want me. Oh, I've told you a dozen times not to try... Where are you? I'll be right over. Sorry, Maury, but I'm on my way. Well, you're waking up, huh, Mr. Goddard? How do you feel? Oh, oh great. You better keep the ice bag. It'll keep the swelling down. I'm some nursey, huh? Do well, you mind telling me just where I am? Oh, sure. Fourth floor, Compton Hotel. Your friends are waiting for you. Oh, fine. They were real glad to see me. They met me at the railroad station. Well, who are you, honey? Me? Hotel stenographer. Drafted for the emergency. I think he feels like talking, Earl. Get lost, Dottie. Sure, honey, sure. Get lost. Remember us? Yeah, vaguely. But there were more than two of you, though. You never should have tried to run, pal. 
Those lumps must be real painful. Skip it, Riggers. You know who I am? Yeah, sure. Post office, Inspector. You're not silly enough to think you might get away with this. We can try. Like Gruber? We don't know Gruber. It won't help to put me in concrete. There's too much interest left around. You, um... You look like a pretty smart guy. What are you hanging around with a gun off like this for? Anybody ever weigh your head? I'm talking to him. I got two years of work tied up in this robbery, got it? I'm all set to go. I'm not going to give it up now. What else can you do? Well, that's just it. Farrar tells me you want $25,000 to keep quiet. That was hours ago. How do we know you're not a plant? You don't. But I know what Gruber knew. With Farrar in your pocket, you've got a real big one on tap. There's a law against robbing the mails, but there's nothing that says you can't talk about it. We're kidding, naturally. Oh, sure. Well, we haven't got 25000 But uh, there's close to a million in this idea we're working on. We could cut you in. Why don't you wake up? You can't beat the mails. they got a system. So have we. With your help, we can make it foolproof. That's why you're still alive. No, thanks. You know, you're the one who's on the spot, Carter, not us. Sure, we'd have to fold, but if we do, you won't be around to know the difference. So, think it over. You, uh, keeping me here? That's right. I'm due back at work in the morning. They'll start checking. You can skip a day. It'll look funny. Look, get this straight, God, until you prove out you're going nowhere. Nowhere we don't want you to. There's nothing to prove out. I'm a postal inspector like Gruber was. I came across something that looked phony, just like he did. Only I see it a little differently than Gruber. You can buy me out. We could also kid you. And kiss off a million-dollar haul? <laughs> now your friend here knows better. Like he said, with my help, it's foolproof. You know, I don't get it. You go along one way for years, and then you pull a complete switch. Why? Well, sooner or later, every rooster wants to lay an egg. Any special reason you want 25 grand? Yeah, the same reasons that you'd like a million. Only I'm not as greedy as you are. Look, I told you before, we haven't got it. If you want to cut the robbery, okay. If you don't, get out. If I walk out of here, your robbery goes out the window. And you go on running this two-bit hotel. For the next ten years, you'll be changing sheets and putting drunks to bed. So don't get so tough. Are you in or out? I'm in. Now, you run your end any way you want, but I take full charge of the post office. No? What's wrong with Farrar? Look, someone else will pick up Farrar the same way I did. If I'm going to risk my neck, I'll do it my way. And one other thing. we got to make it look good downtown. i got to be free to move around on my job as usual. Okay. You sure we're giving him enough? What does that mean, Rigas? We're giving him his own way in a cut. Why don't we all just give him a right arm for old time's sake? You know, sometimes you worry me, Rigas. Somewhere in your blood you got a crazy bug and it's swimming upstream night and day. You better get a cure or you'll kill us all. All right, Earl, all right. Well, let it stand this way. But you got it. One bad move out of you and I'll put you on your back for good. That's for tonight in the station, okay? All square and even? Tough guy, huh, Earl? Real tough guy. I just don't like to be shoved around. Okay, Earl, now that I'm in, how about giving me some of the details? But where are you, Al? Where are you phoning from? Drugstore near the Compton Hotel, my new address. You all right, huh? Yeah, I'm all right. Now listen, Maury, we were right about the robbery. It's a million-dollar reserve stick-up. How'd you find out about it? Well, one thing led to another, and I agreed to help them. Help them? You know what you're saying. Now, don't worry. I'm not going through with the robbery. Now, look, get a rundown on these two names. Earl Bedecker and Joe Regus. How long before the robbery? Oh, well, maybe ten days. Enough time to shop on Gruber and get out with my skin. Now, if we could only tie in sort of quist, we'd have... I'll call you back. Hello. Hi. Remember me? Ah, yes, my favorite nurse. What are you doing out? Can't you phone from the hotel? Can't you? Oh, I don't want to use the phone. I'm just buying some new records. You like Bob? I think I'm starting to. I think I'm starting to. Well, I got some new ones here. Come on back to the hotel. I got a record player up in my room. Oh, I'd like that fine, Dodie. But uh, what about Earl? Will he be there, too? Earl don't ever have to worry about me. <laughs> but what about me? You think Earl has to worry about me? 
That's something I wonder about. Come in, Mr. Goddard? Or do you have to make another phone call? I'm fresh out of dimes, honey. Let's go. Act three of the Hollywood Radio Theater will continue in just a few moments. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. In 1864, Clara Barton gave up a successful job in the patent office in Washington and devoted the rest of her life to bringing physical and mental aid to the wounded and dying on the battlefield. At first, it was the soldiers of the American Civil War. But when the war ended, she was forced to go abroad to recuperate from nervous exhaustion. While she was in Switzerland, Napoleon declared war on Prussia. Clara Barton was urged to return to her own country, but she refused. She felt it was her duty to remain in Europe and help the wounded of this new war. It didn't make any difference to her if they were French or Prussian. She didn't ask the nationality of the sufferer when she stopped the flow of blood from a soldier's wound. In spite of many inconveniences and hardships, she traveled across the rugged German countryside to reach the Prussian front lines. But there she was told that the only way she could be allowed into a front-line camp would be as a prisoner of war. Clara Barton agreed, and as a prisoner until the end of the war, she continued to do her work with the wounded Prussian soldiers. After the war, she remained in Europe to help the defeated French. When she sailed for home in 1873, grateful Europeans bestowed on her many medals of honor, including the Gold Cross of Remembrance, the Jewel of the Red Cross, and the Iron Cross of Merit. Once again, an unselfish American had discovered that by helping others, you help your country. We pause now for station identification. Three of Appointment with Danger, starring William Holden as Al Goddard and Colleen Gray as Sister Augustine, with Dan Riss as Ahern. It's the following morning, and Al Goddard is once again in the visitor's room at St. Michael's School, this time with a snapshot for Sister Augustine. I won't approve of my methods in getting this picture, sister. I stole it from a girlfriend of a gentleman named Earl Bedecker, but I doubt if she'll miss it. Why, it's a picture of Mr. Soderquist. That's right, Soderquist and friends. And I think one of these other men was with him that night in the alley. And this one. His name is Joe Regas. I'm sorry, Mr. Goddard, but I, I just can't be certain. Ah, okay. Is there anything else? Yes, I, um, I told you to stay indoors because you're in danger. And where did I find you? Out in the playground with a bunch of kids. Now, you won't frighten me away from those children. Here, this is for you. A revolver? Mr. Goddard, please. Now, put it away at once. It'll protect you. Take it as a, as a personal favor. I didn't know you could afford personal feelings. All right, it's, it's not personal. It's routine. You know, with a little practice, you could be quite a nice man. Now, put that gun back in your pocket, and I'll show you through the back way. It may be safer for you. You're learning fast, sister. I think the government expects a lot from young men. Well, that's my job. I have to take the risk. Well, they should get some of those politicians to do it. When I'm in trouble, sister, I'll quote you. Now, uh, you be careful. I will. But remember, I have that guardian angel. I've got one, too. It's in my pocket. Only mine never misses. Goodbye, Mr. Goddard. You sure you
You know what you're doing, Al, coming here to the post office? Part of my deal with Bedeker is to keep acting like a cop. Relax, it's okay. Well, what's this big news you mentioned on the phone? Bedeker's changed his mind. He's moved the date up. They've set the robbery for tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow was going to be a week from tomorrow. If he suspects anything, we I can't figure out whether he does or not. But there's one thing for sure. He's set on tomorrow, and I can't stall it. And he's found the perfect flaw. The reserve shipment from Cleveland to Logansport. The flaw? Yeah. There's no through train from Cleveland to Logansport. The money's transferred from one train to the other right here in Gary. Yes, but it's protected all the way by armored trucks and machine guns. All except that seven minutes here in Gary. It travels from one station to the other in a single mail truck. One man and a forty-five pistol. It's a great scheme. So you had to tackle the whole thing by yourself? Well, this time I did. Because you got soft-hearted about a nun? Look, she's our star witness to Gruber's murder. We've got to protect her. All right, you've got a badge. Why don't you arrest me for perjury? How can I? It's the first time I've ever liked you. Look, look, we've got to find Soderquist. We have it. found him. You what? Soderquist is dead. Murdered. Goodman's men found the body early this morning in the canal. You boys keeping secrets or something? Oh, now, take it easy, Take Al. it easy. The Gruber case blows up in our faces. Look, I had to wait till I talked to Washington. Oh, fine, yeah. Now I suppose they want us to go ahead with the robbery. We've got nothing this way that would last five minutes in court. But get them on a charge like that and one of them will break on Gruber. Well, can you think of any other way? <sighs> okay, I'll go on back to the hotel. Just bail out in time, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure, I hear you. Hello? Maury Goddard. I just got back to the hotel and the desk said you'd been calling me. Where are you? I'm in a booth around the corner. I've put you in a bad hole, Al. Right after you left my office, one of the guards found Farrar. He was hiding. Farrar? Just outside my office. He's sure to have heard everything we were talking about. But he slugged the guard and got away. You haven't seen him yet, have you? No, not yet. But let him alone. Don't even look for him. He's bound to get to Bedeker and tell him, so pull out now and run. Don't walk. Uh, I got some things up in my room. I'll get them and meet you in 20 minutes. Oh, we've been waiting for you, Al. How you doing, Inspector? What's wrong? Why? Who says anything's wrong? Nobody, but I open my door and find you here, so... We've been waiting for you, that's all. Now, let's get moving. Where? What's this all about? Just a final check of the plans. We're driving out to the shack. Conan and Connor will meet us out there. Now? Now, pal, now. Well, you got a face a foot long. You just lose your best friend. I'm my best friend. That's what he means. Come on, let's get started. <laughs> What about the two sedans, Cronin? Yeah, we borrowed them out of that parking lot. I've been casing them every day for a month. You got no worry. All right, let's look at the map again. Now, at the end of four minutes, the mail truck will be right here. That's point A. We've been through this a hundred times. We'll go through it again. It's what happens after we grab the door that bothers me. It's simple. We turn west off the boulevard to point B. We switch the cars and then we... Sit down, got it. Sit down. Earl will answer it. Hello. All right, Dottie, what is it? I don't want him out here. You what? Okay, thanks. Farrar called Doty. Anything happened? I don't know. Farrar's coming here? Yeah, that's right. He's on his way. I told him to stay away from us. All of us. Hey, you're jumping all over the place, Al. Settle down. It can't matter that much. Well, if he's followed, it could matter a million dollars worth. Farrar knows what he's doing. Now, let's get back to the map. Now, after point B, these three cross streets have got to be blocked off. That's Regus' job. Roadblocks, detour signs. If anybody sees us, we're dead. Remember that, Regus. The whole job depends on not being recognized. If anybody slips, it won't be me. What about Pal here? Got her. I'll be at the mail truck. Among other things, there's a little matter of making sure we grab the right pouch. Now, what about point C, Earl? There's a million dollars waiting for us. But if we're seen, we'll be running for the rest of our lives. Okay, above. back here at the shack. We'll make another switch of the cars, and then we'll be... Oh, Earl, I gotta talk to you. I... I... Well, put down the gun, Goddard. What are you doing here, Farrar? Well, it's a... about tomorrow, Earl. I, I gotta make sure I... I... Hey, what's he gotta go point a gun at me for? Maybe we ought to rent you a memory. Earl told you to keep away. After this thing happens, the town's gonna be flooded with federal men. 
We're all going to be in a spot, so the first guy who talks is going to get a headache he can't cure. You understand, Farrar? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Anything else, Earl? No, let's break this up. I'll drive back to town with Farrar. But why can't... You heard him. The next time you want to see me, phone the hotel. Let's go, Farrar. I don't trust him, Earl. That punk Farrar. He's scared. He'll do what he's told. Like Soderquist? Soderquist was scared, too. No more of that stuff. I've had enough of it. Look, our luck's gone bad, Earl. It went bad that night in the alley. Stop thinking about that nun. You want to know why I think about her? Because I'm hot and you're not. And sometime years from now, maybe when the rest of you are all scattered, somebody's going to tap me on the shoulder. That's why I think about it. Yeah, but you're clear. Soderquist is dead and you say she never even saw you. Yeah. And sometimes I believe that. Sometimes for as long as two or three minutes at a stretch. Just watch how and where you drive, Farrar. There's a gun on your ribs. You behave yourself, you keep away, and you might get off with five to ten years. Five to ten? Oh, thanks. That's sure going to help with my love life. It's more romantic than being dead. Now, drop me off at the hotel. Thanks, Jody. Uh, can we turn off that music for a minute? Huh? Yeah, sure. Earl come back yet? Uh-uh. Unless he's downstairs. Jody, uh, what did Farrar want when he called you? Well, all he said was he had to talk to Earl. He sounded real nervous. What did he lose, an airmail stamp? You know, Jody, I'd give an awful lot to know what goes on behind that makeup. For instance. Does, uh... You afraid of me, Al? Does Earl ever get jealous? He understands. You can put strings on good women or bad women. But you can't do anything about the lazy ones. You can beat them. They stay about the same. You can't make them do the right thing or the wrong thing. They're lazy. They do the easy thing. And if uh, Earl found me here with you now, alone? I don't know. But it sounds real exciting. A little too exciting, honey. Oh, uh, if Earl asks for me... Yeah? Tell him I'm at the post office making a final check. And it looks like we're set, Al. Goodman's bringing his boys here tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock. And I'll give you over an hour. Okay. Now, just tell him to be careful. I'll be riding in the hold-up car. And don't close in until we're all back at that shack. Now, what about Farrar? Goodman's tailing him. He'll pick him up at noon tomorrow. He'll be safer in jail. I'll keep him there. Bettiger doesn't want him around either until it's all over. Where do you go now, Al? I'll back to the hotel by way of St. Michael's School. So I'm to go back to Fort Wayne. Is that it, Mr. Goddard? That's right, sister. A uh, police matron will stop by tomorrow afternoon and go with you. There's nothing else that I can do? Well, with Sodaquist dead, I'm afraid you're out of it. I haven't been of much help, have I? Goodbye, Mr. Goddard. I'll remember you in my prayers. Thank you, sister. If you haven't anything else, at least now I've got a good lawyer. Well, we better start. It's almost five o'clock. Anything from you, Al? No. Now, look. Just don't get gun happy. You can rob Fort Knox and live, but steal a dime and kill a post office clerk, and they'll spend the rest of their lives running you down. All right, start moving, Cronin. Uh, there's one other thing, but I'll tell you later in the car. We're changing point C. Right. What do you mean you're changing point C? Sounds simple, pal. We're changing it. I found out just a couple of hours ago. Found out what? There's a better road to the shack. There's less traffic. So we're changing point C. Is there any reason why we shouldn't? I know. No, I guess not. You're not driving, so don't let it worry you. Now, where's your coat? In my room. Well, get it, and go out through the lobby and meet me in the back. Inspector's office, Ahern. I'm phoning from my room, Maury, but uh, there's no time, so don't ask questions. Go ahead. They've just changed point C. I don't know the new location. That means you'll have to watch all the roads in case there's a slip-up. If there isn't, they'll wind up as scheduled at the shack. Now, I won't have a chance to... I'd say you pulled a boner, Al. I'd say so, too, Dodie. I heard what you just said on the phone. 
Might help if I hadn't been with Earl for so long. You're going to tell him? If I told him, he'd have to kill you. Better make me, what do they call it, accessory or something? And you don't love anybody that much? Not 25 years worth. I'm a loser either way. Suppose they get away with all that dough this afternoon. Be wearing mink coats and high dodge and hamburger joints. Living on the run till they catch up with Earl. Well, at least you read the book. What are you going to do, Dodie? When you walk out, I'm going to pack my bag and leave. I'm going to forget names and faces and what's going to happen to all of you in the next hour or so. They can still get you for withholding information. Not if I tell a government agent. So I'm telling you, they're going to hold up a mail truck. I got a pack, so goodbye. You uh, won't get a gold star, but thanks anyway. Don't bother. Pharaoh was good to me. I hope he kills you. Calling car 73. Calling Inspector Ahern. This is Goodman calling car 73. Come in, Goodman. They pulled the job. Everything is scheduled except Regus. Regus? What about him? We followed his car from 4th Street. He's gone to the railroad station. He could be skipping town by train, but it doesn't make sense. Forget Rika. Stick to your schedule. Right. See you later at the shack. Afternoon, sister. Good afternoon. I'm from the police department. We'd like to talk to you. But I I thought I was to go back to Fort Wayne. Yeah, sure. Later. Well, if you think you need me... Oh, the matron. She's getting our tickets. I'd better go and tell her. Now, look, there isn't any time. My partner will tell her this way, sister. My car's just outside. Where's Regas, Earl? Why isn't he here? I don't know, and I don't like it. We'll wait five minutes if he doesn't show up. What is this place, anyway? I told you, the new point C. It used to be a quarry or something. Earl, he's coming. Regas. All right, get him over here. You and Gunner stole the money in back of his car. Hey, he's heading for the shed. He's got someone in the car with him. What's he talking about? What shed? There's an old tool shed back there. Come on, Goddard. We're wasting time. Come on in, boys. Take a look. I found her, see? The nun. What's he talking about? An old friend, Al. An old friend of Riga's from Laporte. She's been to the police. She told me. And she got a little noisy, Earl, so I stuffed her mouth. Uh, What else did she tell you? Nothing yet. Now that we're all here, she's going to tell plenty. You're crazy, Regus. Do you want us to get off? Stop arguing. We haven't got time. How about it, Earl? Okay? I, uh... I don't know. She knows about the robbery. She's seen us, all of us. Killing her isn't going to do any good. Besides, who'd touch her? She's a nun. Regus could do it. Real quick, pal. What harm can she do us? She doesn't know our names or anything about us. If we're caught, she can identify us. If we're caught, we're through anyway. Look, you're here on a free ride, Goddard. Don't come to the party and give away drinks. Take her gag off, Regus. I said take the gag off. Yeah, sure. Now listen to me, sister. We'll take your word. You've never seen us. You can't identify us. We'll take your word. Thank you. But I couldn't give you my word about a thing like that. What difference does it make? A great deal. I couldn't let my silence be used as a weapon against the law. But you're not hired to defend the law. I'm sorry. I cannot give you my word. All right, Regus, take her out back somewhere. Come on, lady. Leave her alone. Lie down, Rover. You need a new mouth, Regus. Please, please don't. Please, please, somebody stop the fight. Come on, break it up. we got to get out of here. For this, we got time, maybe. With a million dollars to split, just pray for a tie. Mr. Goddard, he's got a gun! I had to do it, Earl. It was Regus or me. Yeah. Well, what are you waiting for? If those shots were heard, we're, we're going to be in trouble. You're already in trouble, Mr. Goddard. Now drop the gun. The sister knows you, huh? Well, you picked a talky partner. How far's it gone? It's a fix all the way. The whole area staked out for miles around. Only we got you and we got her. Leave her here. I'll see that you get through the police. No, thanks. You don't have a chance, Earl. Leave her alone. I promise to get you through. For what? To grab 20 minutes of air and die on a back road somewhere? Right now, 20 minutes is a lot of time. All right, get out to the car. Sister, you're either lucky or living right. You drive, Gunner. That's just a warning, Medicare. We've got you surrounded. Put 
your hands up and start walking. Get around to the back. There's a path through the woods. But the money. We got a million bucks in the car. We'll give you five seconds. We got better. nothing. You heard what he said. It's a fix all the way. The dough's phony. Come on. Hell, look, they're closing in. They're back there, too. Then shut up and start shooting. <laughs> Taking you to a hospital. But if you got anything to say, you better say it now. I, I'm gonna die. Yeah. You asked for it, Bettiger. Yeah. Sure. Well, where's Goddard? I'm here, Earl. It's too bad. I'd walk over, but I can't. My leg. Your aim was a little low. Just tell me one thing, will you? For the record, Al. Was the dough phony, too? No, it was real. You'll die rich, Earl. Take it easy, Al. Did you get them all? We got them. Mr. Goddard. It's all right, sister. I'll make it. Now, you did fine. Are you sure you're not hurt? No. When the shooting started, I just threw myself down on the floor. That's what the boys do at school when they play those terrible games. <laughs> Maury, get her on that train, will you? I... I think she wants to get back to those kids. I've got a car waiting any time you're ready, sister. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Goddard. God bless you. Well, for once you were right, Maury. Somebody who doesn't have a pitch. Al, if you stay with it and work real hard, one of these days you're going to qualify for the human race. <laughs> Thanks. I may join at that. In a moment, our stars will return. The occupation of the Japanese city of Yokosuka is a good example of democracy at work. The first thing our troops had to do was clean up their own area. But then they looked at the devastation, the sickness, and the low morale of the people around them, and they set to work. To create better living conditions, they demolished rotten, rat-infested buildings. They converted unused buildings into schoolrooms, gymnasiums, and chapels. And with their own funds, they furnished much of the equipment. For health, they covered the city giving anti-tuberculosis shots, typhoid inoculations, x-ray pictures, and smallpox vaccinations. To raise the spirits of the people, they started boys' clubs, women's clubs, Red Cross groups. The occupation is over now, but the Japanese have had a taste of democracy. They like it. They've seen it work. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. William Holden and Colleen Gray, please come forward for a curtain call. Bill, have you ever had a real appointment with danger? Well, Irving, I tried to walk across Hollywood Boulevard again this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let him kid you, Irving. A few months ago, Bill made a trip to Japan and Korea to entertain our troops. He went to the front lines and hospitals and talked to the boys. Well, it was a real privilege to meet them. I hope to go back soon. How about you, Colleen? Have you had any dangerous appointments lately? Well, I've been vanquished. Vanquished? How awful. No, Irving. The Vanquished is the name of my latest picture for Paramount, co-starring John Payne and Jan Sterling. It's packed with danger and excitement. Now, really, Colleen, if, if you want to plug your picture, why don't you just come out and say it like I do? All right, so go ahead. Stalag 17. Hey, Bill, watch your language. <laughs> <laughs> you remember Stalag 17, Colleen? It was one of the funniest plays on Broadway, and it's Bill's latest for Paramount. <laughs> of course. Now, tell me, what's the latest, Irving? A beautiful love story with a perfect setting. The romantic countryside of Italy. It's Paramount Pictures' moving and sensitive drama of September Affair. And starring in their original roles in this unforgettable romance will be Joan Fontaine and Joseph Cotton. Well, we'll be looking forward to that one, Irving. Good night. Good night. Good night. And you have a most pleasure to return to.
produced by Mr. Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is under the direction of Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.